Hi folks, I'm Sean Crabtree. Welcome to Dental Profits, where today we're going to be talking with Steve Gephardt, an industry insider in the lending institution who's going to talk to you about several things that you need to know when it comes to lending and your practice. Stay with us. Hi folks, I'm Sean Crabtree. And I'm Cameron Bailey. We don't want to change the way you do business. We want to change the way you're thinking about your business. We want you to have better results, happier clients, and make more money. Let's get it started. And welcome into the Dental Profits, the show that is all about helping you have happier clients, better results, make more money, and enjoy the ride. And I think we're on the enjoy the ride part today. My guest is Steve Gephardt. Steve has been in banking for 20 years, and Steve has worked in um, lending institutions from $100 billion worth of capital to private boutique Type. Is, is that the way I should say that, Steve? To private boutique type lending, which is where he is right now. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. Steve, I'm really glad to have you here. And, you know, you are going to put some answers to some question marks that a lot of folks are having right now. If, if you're driving down the road listening to this or if you're watching this uh, on video, then chances are you're falling into one of three categories. You're perhaps a young associate who is maybe working in a corporate scenario, thinking about hanging out your own shingle. Perhaps you're, 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 you're not in that scenario. You've owned your own business for a period of time. You're, you're thinking about possibly uh, growth or you're thinking about potentially an exit strategy down the road. Or thirdly, maybe you're on the, uh, on the downhill side and you're really close to that exit strategy. And that's why we have Steve Gephardt here. Um, Steve, welcome in. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me, Sean. Now, before we jump in, I mean, you I don't want to skip over your uh, uh, your credibility here. I mean, you've been in the lending business now for 20 years and you've worked with big and small. You've worked in all sorts of different capacities. Tell us a little bit about what your, you know, what your relationship is right now uh, in terms of lending. What is your title? Well, you know, after all these years in the business in different markets like Cleveland and West Palm Beach and now Nashville, uh, large banks, small banks, I found that working at a, a smaller institution that is very uh, client driven, relationship driven is a key part of my success and, and what I like to do. And, uh, you know, we're here to talk about dental opportunities. And I think dentists in particular and their practices, they want to have a relationship with exactly. their bank. They, they want to be able to pick up the phone and talk to somebody who knows them, who knows their business, whether it be to talk about the practice financing side of it or even their personal. And, and you know, at the larger institutions today, less personal, less relationship driven, more bottom line numbers driven. And Can I use I, the word corporate? Can I say corporate? Yes, yes. So um, I found for myself that having a working in a place that values the relationship, values the individual, both from the employee perspective and, and the, the client, in this case, the dentist, is very important to me to be able to get things done and deliver the kind of service that I, that I want to for my client. And that's what you are. You're, you're a relationship manager. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think that the, the, the point you make is uh, is very timely. Um, I think everybody I don't think that escapes anybody who's listening to this or who's watching this. Um, you know, if you are a dentist, you are all about the relationship that you have with your patients. And you want that same kind of relationship when it comes to the person that you're dealing with in a lending institution. So, Steve. I mean, you've been in this industry for 20 years and you've experienced all of those sorts of things, not having that one-on-one -on -one and now having that one-on-one -on -one kind of relationship. I'm curious, in terms of what you've learned, what would you say, back to my analogy, if I'm a few years out of school, if I'm a young dentist, I'm a few years out of school and perhaps I'm associating and I'm looking to uh, hang my own shingle, what are the what are the things that you've run into that I need to be educated about? What are the things I should be thinking about? What are the challenges that you've run into? Right. Well, you know, if you're if you want to do a startup practice, you know, that's that's obviously more difficult. The ideal situation uh, for a young dentist is to um, work with uh, 
a practice, an individual who you can step into that role as an owner at some point. Um, what we look for as a lending institution, specifically on, on medical and dental practices, is the individual having experience not only practicing, but in that specific practice. Ah. So the clientele knows them, they know the market, and those are real successful situations. We, we feel very comfortable lending to the young dentist buying into a practice when, when they've been there for a while. And you know, to define that length of time, it could be a year, it could be two years, wh whatever that period of time is. But it's much more problematic if, they, if they're just coming into a new market, they're not known, and they're not working with an established practice, that type of thing. To start your own business is, uh, is much more difficult, much more risk for not only the bank, but, but also for the doctor, right? So um, whenever possible, we like to get into involved in those situations where you've got an associate who works a period of time, gets to know the practice, gets to know the clientele, and they get to know him. And then that becomes a very successful situation. Great advice. Great advice. And of course, from the doctor's standpoint, too, um, that's a much easier situation than starting from scratch. You're able to walk in with some sort of capitalization, uh, some sort of income happening right away, right? That's right. And, and on those situations where because the market might be smaller or a, a unique situation where there really isn't the opportunity to buy to join a practice as an associate for a period of time, you really almost have to establish yourself as the owner and right off the bat, you're going to need some capital, you're going to need some support, whether it comes from friends or family, that type of thing to get that up and running. I'm curious. Um, by the way, thank you. That's great advice. I'm curious. Uh, you know, just to stay with the young doctors, I mean, one of the things that we run into all the time, and I understand this because we've all been there, um, the young doctor who is a few years out of school, uh, their biggest concern is this uh, school note that is hanging over their head and they are, um, you know, uniquely focused on, on, on getting rid of that debt. What, what advice would you say about that? Well, you know, I guess part of the decision process and that is the, the interest carrier, the cost of that debt. But um, what we do see a lot is people who are, are uh, paying that out, paying it down as fast as possible, aggressively as possible. And that's not a bad thing. But if you're also uh, trying to establish your own practice or buy into a practice, you want to have as much capital as you can put into the project as you can. So, you know, one of the options or decisions you have to make is, do I pay down the debt or do I accumulate some, some cash to put into that process? We kind of like the latter side of it because you can always pay down the debt at some other time, you know, from that cash. But if you, once you've used that cash, you can't get it back. So I guess what I'm hearing you say, Steve, which is great advice, um, you know, be mindful of the fact that, that, uh, while you're trying to pay down debt, keep in mind also that that, that cash is something that you'll really need if you're going to, if you're going to move into either one of those scenarios, whether it's a startup or, or whether it's, um, buying into a practice that you're currently in, um, be mindful of the fact that that cash will be needed and you can always pay off the note, but it might be tougher to get the cash. Yes. And, and, you know, the cash could even be used, uh, for your own, your own personal assets in terms of buying a home or that type of thing. But once you've paid down that student loan, that that cash is gone. Yeah. So if your if your goals and ambitions are to own your own practice, um, probably building up as much cash reserve as you can to put into a project is, is a good thing. Yeah. I really like the way you guys approach this. Um, I mean, you're coming at it from the standpoint, uh, you guys have a real focus on, um, dental practices and healthcare in general, but specifically dental practices. I love the way you guys are approaching this. It's, you know, we want to be, we want to have that relationship with you personally, commercially, whatever that is, I want to be your guy. And I really appreciate that. I don't think there's enough of that um, in this old world, in my opinion. Um, so what are some other things that you think, if I'm a young guy, what should I be mindful of? Well, if you're a young guy and you want to get into an ownership position and a practice, and I'm not sure why you wouldn't want to do that, 
Um, <laughs> one of the key, one of the key things, and this has really shocked me as a, as a banker, and a lot of, of young dentists coming into town. And Nashville is a big and booming, growing town. We have a lot of people wanting to be in this market. The demographics are are, are terrific. Um, a lot of them come in without get have being represented by a good accounting firm, by good accountants, and by a good accountant and a good accounting firm, I mean somebody who knows dentistry, knows practices, who has clients in that business. You know, we have people coming in who, who want to buy into a uh, practice and they're using the valuation by uh, somebody who's really working for the existing dentist. And it, depending on, once again, where you are in that life cycle of dentistry, um, you can understand that, that, you know, that this is a big decision and uh, you need to be represented, have a good pro forma, you know, how are you going to pay that debt back? And uh, too often I see young people who come in and they, they have the right idea, they want to do something, they have a good opportunity, but maybe they're afraid to uh, engage an accountant maybe because of the cost or that, that type of thing, where they, they wind up working with somebody who really doesn't understand dentistry, doesn't understand practices. And, um, and so they, they kind of get right, right out of the gate uh, behind the, uh, Behind, behind the eight ball, so whatever. to speak. Eight ball, yeah. Yeah. Right. So um, I've seen some situations, and we think dentistry is an outstanding industry to lend to. The uh, default rates um, uh, are, are low, um, and that's a good thing for, for the bank and a good thing for the dentist. Um, but How low are they, Steve? I've heard it's less than 1%. Is that true? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, uh, I'm looking at charge off rates to the bank. This, this information may be a couple years old, but it's probably pretty representative of less than 50 basis points, meaning less than one half of 1%. Wow. And if you're looking at uh, uh, Dennis, believe it or not, uh, the, one, the one industry that may be uh, even a little bit less risk is veterinarians, but other than that, optometry, podiatry, uh, medical physicians, all higher than dentists. So we like the business where we have seen some problems with, with people is when they overpay for the practice up front. And once again, that goes back to getting the right representation, yeah, right. The right accounting firm that can value the practice you're buying. And uh, because like I said, if you are, are you overpay up front, then for the next 10 years, you're going to be kind of stuck with that debt trying to catch up. So my recommendation you know, get with the practice where that you can buy in um, and become an owner in a not too distant future. And then obviously have a plan in place with that dentist that you can buy until eventually get to the point where you're the majority owner. And secondly, have proper representation so that you don't wind up overpaying upfront. I'm just curious, um, you, you, are you saying that uh... – the bank is more favorable to a, a longer term transition buy versus a associate who's worked as an associate for, a, let's say, a period of time and then buying out totally. Is there, are those looked at differently from a lending? Well, standpoint? usually what we'll see is a kind of a stepped in um, purchase. So up front for over the after after being there as an associate for a year or two, they might buy 10 or 20 sure. percent of sure. and then kind of on a stepped up basis. Um, and we see that too. I just wondered from a lending standpoint, I mean, I, you know, for, for, for us, I mean, it's a better situation all the way around because if you're the owner doctor, you're growing the asset as it's selling. If you're the buying doctor, then you're helping to build something that's going to have more value uh, at the time that you fully own it. Um, I, I see both sides. I just wondered if it was different from a, from a lending standpoint. What you're saying is really good stuff. So if I'm a young um Young dentist out there, some really great advice. Number one, uh, realize it's more difficult from a startup standpoint. Uh, number two, um, focus and be mindful on the fact that you, 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 it's great to pay off school notes, but but you probably need some some heavy weight on the cash. And then number three, don't be afraid to have good representation because if I understood you correctly, what you're saying, if you've got a great CPA that's not simply representing the seller, then uh, that person should save you money absolutely in the long run. Okay, great. Now, let me switch gears real quick. You're giving us a lot of great information, Steve. Let's say I am the 
40-ish uh, dentist, and let's say that I've got uh, a decade under my belt, and um, maybe I'm, I'm looking to uh, perhaps expand or get into a new building, or maybe I'm thinking down the road, I need to go ahead and get that associate in the door as we move closer to uh, whatever that exit might look like. What are the things, what's the advice that you would give me from a lender standpoint? Well, once again, you know, you're at that point in life in, in your practice that we love doing business with you. You've got a history, you have a track record, you're trying to grow, and we want to help you do that. That's how that's how we make money. That's how we grow as well. Sure. And uh, so, obviously, you have to have a plan. Are you going to grow organically from your current location, or do you need to change your location to stimulate growth? Do you need to expand the number of locations? Um, do you want to bring in somebody who will be your partner for the next 10 or 20 years? Or do you want to kind of grow slower, stay mm -hmm. more independent? What's slower? your long-term goal, in other words? And that's when that's when you need somebody like us to help you get to the bottom of what is your long-term direction so that these steps are taken on purpose that's right. toward a long-term direction versus uh, you know facing each of those those questions as a standalone question. Uh, and re we run into that all the time. And I think uh, depending on, you know, how you partner with, with your dental clients and, and the decisions they make, you know, we can support that in many different ways. Once again, I'm assuming you've been with a good accounting firm and you've, you've, uh, you've got good financial statements that, that can provide uh, a great history of your, your track record. Um, your accountants, especially when you're gonna get involved in larger projects, whether it be equipment, leasehold improvements, new real estate, new locations, um, they can work on a, a pro forma for you. So you, they can say, okay, well, if we invest this amount and we grow our business with Crabtree's help, um, and you know, what will the payoff be and how quickly can we burn off that debt? That type. So when, and I think sometimes they, people think that the projections are for the bank, but in reality, they're for you, the dentist. Exactly. It's, you need to know that information because sometimes you, you run those numbers and you say, wait a minute. Uh, I don't know that that is as profitable as I think it needs to be for me to, to take on a million dollars in new debt or a half a million dollars in new debt. Um, so I think the projections and working with that good accounting firm that can, can uh, show you where you're gonna be once you make these changes and, and that type of thing. And, and we all know projections, uh, uh, that's exactly what they are. Right, <laughs> right. Change, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes you exceed them, sometimes you don't. But um, my, that's one of my jobs is to say, hey, are these uh, uh, fair representations, fair assumptions that you're making? You know, some, you, know you say you're gonna double your revenue growth, is that, realistic or not but i think once again and is it comfortable i would assume is one of the questions you would ask as well is this comfortable based on where you're trying to go and once again we see people coming together um you know have an instant partnership to grow um, to grow revenues those kinds of things so that down the road you've got a bigger asset to sell and realize more money for it down the road so talking with steve gephardt here steve this is really good stuff um and one of the biggest things that I, I didn't mean to gloss over, but uh, if I am if I am in dentistry, almost regardless of where I am uh, in terms of uh, the maturity of my career, less than one half of one percent, I think you said, is the default rate for uh, for for dental practices. That is, uh, I mean, that's great news. If I'm a dentist and I'm hearing that, I'm going, okay, these guys are thinking I'm a great risk. So regardless of what I think, that's uh, that's telling me. That's telling me there's a lot of confidence here. Good stuff. Now let's move to the third piece. Let's say, I think the last stat that I looked at said that the median age uh, of a dentist in the U.S. is 50. So, of course, there's, uh, there's, there's, that's the case. Then, then the majority of the guys are, are looking to exit at some point in the near future. What are the considerations that you think they should be thinking about as it comes to uh, the lending, I know there's there's all sorts of ways that an associate can buy in, uh, and a lot of times that involves a lending institution. Sometimes there's also 
a scenario where maybe there's a situation in combination with a lending institution where there's maybe some owner financing. What I mean, what would you say about all of that or anything else that you think I would need to be concerned about as I'm closer to that exit stage? Right. Well, I see a lot of people, of course, doing a lot of things <laughs> once they get in that 50 plus range. I thought you were going to say, I see them doing a lot of things that we would not recommend. I thought that's where you were going there. <laughs> no, no. Um, you know, different different ideas in different markets. But, you know, they want to build the practice uh, as much as they can, not only for current income, but for that, that sales price down the road. You know, a lot of people at that point, they've been in the practice for, you know, 20 years. And maybe they're, they're in their original location. Um, They've maybe had to refresh one other time, and now they're looking at refreshing leasehold improvements, equipment, those kinds of things, uh, really for that last step before they build the practice up to sell. And uh, so we see a lot of people trying to position themselves to do that. So maybe that original plan Would they that had. Be your recommendation. Well, once again, I think every 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 market, every individual is different. I see a lot of people who are. Are, you know, even at 50, 60 years old, they're expanding, they're growing, they're adding markets, they're, uh, they're doing things that um, maybe if you look strictly at the age, you'd say, well, why are you doing that? But they're trying to build up the value of the practice so that, sure. you know, they can sell for a higher price. You know, clearly at 50 years old, you need to be address addressing the succession plan issue. Who are you going to sell to? It's much better easier and much better to have that buyer working side by side with you for a number of years. It's, it makes them bankable. It, you know, you know them, you know, you've created a legacy. You've been in the market here. You don't, you don't want to sell to just anybody. You want to sell to somebody who's going to carry on your good work. And so Steve, uh, you now, know, now, now, let me stop you there. This is a, this is a great point. Um, and, and I've been advocating this for 20 years. Uh, and a lot of folks uh, take me up on that, but but I'm surprised at the number that don't. Um, why do you think that is? I mean, from a common sense standpoint, it makes total sense that as a seller, I'm going to have much more value if my buyer is already built in and if they're connected to my client base, to my team, to the location, to uh, the reputation in the marketplace. All of that makes total sense. And it also makes sense that um, as a seller, I mean, there's a relationship there, um, there that there, there's some buy-in from the associate who's going to be, I mean, not buy-in dollar-wise, but there's there's a level of ownership there that, that an associate who has helped build that, in my view, um, there's a level of ownership that when it comes to the purchase, that, that's just a win for everybody. Why do you think more people don't do that? Why do they wait to the last minute and then sell? You know, it, that is a huge surprise because the really successful transitions are just like we said, the ones where they've They've planned it. They've brought in one or more uh, uh, younger people to be in the transitional mode, the succession mode, and then they can kind of control how fast they want to uh, step back into retirement, shall we say? You know, and when we're talking about that, we you know, just like any other business, we have people who want to start phasing, slowing down in their mid fifties or sixty. And we're seeing more more people, of course, st stay in the game longer, mm -hmm. 65, yeah. even 70. And when you have the right succession plan and the right program in place, you know, you can kind of choose to transfer that ownership over a gradual period period of time to make it, you know, less stressful for everybody concerned and keep you in the game a little bit longer. And, you know, to the point where you're at some point, you're 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 the associate and they are the owner. But once again, I see most people wanting, wanting to, for a period of time, wanting to generate some income, wanting to work, of course, a, 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 a smaller schedule. Mm -hmm. but, and that, that's very helpful to the, the acquiring dentist, to the younger dentist, having that experience and having that, that connection with the community and to the, the clientele. Stay. There's a mentorship opportunity there as well That's in a very big way, not to mention the, uh, you know, just the, the, the goodwill value of, of, of a scenario like that. When, when I see a, a, re, a dentist selling in retirement and he wants to walk away right away, 
that throws up some caution flags to me. Either something isn't right there or something, maybe he isn't comfortable with the people that are buying the practice. And uh, so it, it doesn't mean we don't get involved in those things, but it, it kind of does throw some cautionary flags out there because, you know, usually we see people who want to phase out over a period of time, generate some additional income, kind of keep stay plugged in. Once again, especially in, in, in dentistry, you're building a legacy. You're building a relationship with the community. Absolutely. And, and you know, you see Absolutely. a lot of corporate roll-ups and things going this these days, but the those those people obviously who are interested in that type of thing don't have a connection, the community, the legacy, that type of thing. They're only interested in the bottom line. So a lot of people in dentistry- So you guys are for the little guys. You're for the well, little guys. Well, we are the little bank for the little guys, I and, guess. And we are we and, are as well. We are the little you know, guys as well. Cap, cap yeah. stars about a billion foreign assets, which is you know a great success story in, in 10 years of being in business. And uh, but we're really our niche is working with small businesses, and and of course you know the dentistry uh, fits right into that. I know the personal. Just on a side note, I know the personal relationships that that, that you value. Um, do you guys work outside of Nashville? Well, we have uh, offices in the greater Nashville area. We defined our market territory as being in the state of Tennessee and within about a hundred miles. Um, uh, now that being said, we. Uh, depending on the situation, we can stretch out a little bit farther. Sure. But our primary market area is Middle Tennessee, 100 miles within uh, Nashville. And I would assume because of exactly what you're talking about. It's about that personal relationship. And I, and I totally see value in that. I respect that. Um, and, and uh, you know, the succession plan is the word I wrote down. That is the big takeaway. Um, I, if I am closer to that exit stage, I asked this question a moment ago. Why do you think it is that that a lot of folks do not do not um, approach an exit strategy in that way versus a sell straight away? And my belief and my experience tells me that it's strictly because it's a lack of planning. It is absolutely just a kick in the can down the road and not ever slowing down long enough to ask myself, when might that be and how might that look and what should I be doing right now? To me, that is one of the biggest takeaways that you've brought here um, with the median age in dentistry. It is never too early or too late, in my opinion, to create a, a succession plan and that you need a succession plan in now, I don't know what you feel about this, but my experience is as a selling dentist, you are never going to get the value out of a practice in a walkaway fire sale that you would in a transition. You're just Absolutely. not going to get the uh, the dollar there. And, you know, we talked a little bit about the trends and and default rates and, and the demographics in, in, in the community and in dentistry. But there there are more sellers every day and fewer buyers. That's so a that, really good point. So you really need to do that planning and you probably need to start it earlier than they have in the past. Because what you don't wanna do is wake up and you're 62 or 63 years old and you don't have a plan in place, you don't have an associate and you have a practice that has been kind of static, hasn't grown. Uh, we work with them all the time, you do too. And, and then it's, it's, it's very difficult to get the value out of it. It's a fire sale at that point, yeah. Or God forbid, uh, you know, your hands go, your back, it gets to the point that you, uh, you just can no longer do it. And now you're on a time frame, and that's never a good scenario in any selling situation is being on a time frame, right? Absolutely. Really good point. Really good point. Um, which makes sense. I mean, there are fewer buyers you need to plan right now and you need to plan a succession. You need to have a succession plan. Um, Hmm. I'm curious, uh, and I, you and I have never talked about this, so I, I don't know what kind of answer I'm going to get here, but I would like to know. Um, if, I'm, if I'm closer to that exit stage, um, I have my own uh, sort of uh, rule of thumb here, but I'd love to get it from the expert. What is a just general down and dirty rule of thumb that I might expect – I know there's a lot that goes into a practice evaluation. 
Mm -hmm. But just a down and dirty, kind of a rough cut um, rule of thumb. What what could I uh, what could I expect in terms of an evaluation? Yeah. Um, and once again, you know, probably the the best expert is that accounting firm that specializes in practice. Right. Uh, I see the, kind of the number that I always see, kind of as a starting point, is seventy percent of uh, the last twelve months collections. Um, but, you know, also going back to the conversation we had about people overpaying up front, um, especially when that dentist walks, away, the seller is walking away, you really have to watch that. Right. You know, if, 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 uh, somebody for whatever reason, perhaps overpays, but the dentist, you know, you're, you're there as a partner for a period of time, you know, you, people, they want to work with you and work together and, and maybe correct uh, some mistakes have been made, but if that person is going, I mean, they're, they're just leaving behind, you know, whatever damage is done. Mm -hmm. uh, but I see that kind of that 70% of, of the past, uh, the trailing 12 month uh, uh, collections as, as kind of the benchmark. You know, some of the other things you have to consider, you know, what, you know, the age of the practice, sure. um, you know, demographics, the, the practice, mm -hmm. older building, mm -hmm. older equipment, older, you know, furniture fixtures. And so you're buying, perhaps you're getting, you feel you're getting a good price, but you may have to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. to bring it up to speed. So if you're in a situation like that, um, then that you probably don't want to offer 70% of the trailing 12 month. Conversely, if you're a, at that later stage in your, your life and your practice life, and you want to make the practice more attractive, you pr probably need to be doing some reinvesting once again at 50, 55 years old, so that at 60, you don't, you're not, you know, the young dentist trying to buy in or that type of thing or buy isn't looking at that and saying, I can't offer you that because I have to do all this upgrading and that type of thing. Good advice. Really good advice. And so, and that's, that's what I was going to say too. I mean, that's what we run in 65. 65 to 75 is, is, is kind of what we run into of the, of the trailing 12 months collections. Very, very interesting stuff. Steve, a lot of good takeaways here. Really good stuff. I have to tell you, not only are you well-dressed uh, the, with, the, with the blue there, man, you're looking great. Um, you are not the boring old banking guy. I very much appreciate you joining us today. Lots of good stuff here. If I'm the young guy, here's what I got. If I'm the young guy, what you're telling me is that I need to be mindful of a cash position and not perhaps be um, overly focused on paying down debt if I'm about to move into a practice. And always the recommendation would be um, – uh, not to necessarily go with a startup, but to go into a practice where you're already familiar with and you've got some, uh, you got some history there. Less than one half of 1% is the uh, default rate in dentistry. And a couple of other great things that you said, I really love this. Get a succession plan. If I'm on the ladder end of that scale, I need to have a succession plan because as a seller, I'm going to get more value than I would if I walk away and I always run the risk. The further I kick the can down the road in terms of that succession plan, the more opportunity I have for bad things to happen like health issues and all of that. And then I have to have um, a fire sale. And as you said, which is something I cover all the time, there are fewer buyers out there and there are more sellers. I need to be aware of that. If I have a built-in uh, uh, buyer, I'm in a much better position. Really Absolutely. good stuff. Steve Gephardt. Steve, you are the man. I tell you what, we're going to have you back. I very much appreciate the time that you spent with us. Um, and I would, I, I very much appreciate the uh, takeaways that you've given us. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Sean. This, is, this has been Dental Profits, where it's all about you having happier clients, better results, making more money, and enjoying the ride. And that's exactly what we've got today. Thanks again. We'll see you next time. Take care.